think uh, it's almost inevitable that uh, psychedelics have been playing a part in uh, religious, mystical experiences since the beginning of time. They are a powerful way for human beings to blow their little egos out of the water and contact the divine. I mean, one thing, you know, the whole of spirituality has its roots, its ancient roots, in the shamanic traditions. Mm. We still have those traditions, yeah. and a, a huge number of them are based on whatever the indigenous psychedelic happens to be in that area. Mm. Because what could be more natural than you pick up a mushroom or something like that, you ingest it, and my God, you're having visions. You're seeing life in a new way. You're seeing through the appearances. You have a greater understanding, or at least your your the confines of your common sense understanding is exploded. And it's transformational. Yeah. So, but as regards, because, and this is the problem with the ancient pagan mysteries in general, they were mysteries. Everybody who participated was sworn to secrecy. And what's incredible, look, the mysteries of Eleusis were celebrated for a thousand years in the Greek world. Many people, Roman emperors, Cicero, Seneca, we get, uh, all the greats, were initiates. None of them broke their oath and told us what happened. But we know that initiates drank a drink before they began on the sacred way to Eleusis, which was a painful purgatorial process. They were beaten by people with rods. Uh, it was m meant to be a, a visceral, physical experience. And I feel that it was, it was certainly heightened by fasting. So whatever, if they did take anything then, we know that that would have been intensified, because it always is when you, when you, when you fast beforehand. Uh, archaeologists have found opium pipes at Eleusis, so we've got enough hints to know. And they, the ancients were master pharmacopoeists. They, they, they knew all of the intoxicated. And it, as Tim says, it came out of the shamanic tradition. There isn't a shamanic tradition that doesn't use power plants, I don't think. Not the oldest ones, I'd say. So it's kind of inevitable, but the clues, again, you know, it's very, very difficult. We haven't focused on this area in our work, but... Um, there's a guy called uh, Michael Hoffman who uh, has investigated this area and produced a lot of lucid work. And his point of view, and I think quite rightly, is like if Paul and other people are eating the body of the God and having an incredible visionary... I mean, Paul says, again, it just completely contradicts the idea of a historical Jesus because he says... Everything I know about Jesus came to me by revelation. Where is this coming from? What is the source of his experiences? I wouldn't be at all surprised. I mean, uh, a chap called John Allegra many years ago wrote a book, The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, which was about precisely this. He believes that uh, the cultic meal of sharing the book was people getting together and eating some psychoactive substance together and having revelations of the Holy Spirit, what have you. So I'm, I'm open to, to any investigations and whatever evidence comes up. You know, I think it's, through personal experience, myself, one of the most powerful ways to... Well, Aldous Huxley himself, where in... Uh, is it Heaven and Hell? Doors of Perception. Doors of Perception, when he, see, when he looks at the, um, the bamboo chair, I think it is, and he says... I suddenly, and this is a man who spent his entire life writing about the religious traditions of the world, the mystical traditions of the world, but he never actually had an experience. And here he was on mescaline, I believe, mm -hmm. looking at this chair suffused with light, and he says, hear all these words that people had used before, like grace and all these mis Suddenly I was having that experience, which is fantastic. I think, didn't he die on... LSD. Yeah. Uh, Alan Watts the same. Uh, again, a great scholar, actually had the experience in this way. So if that's happening to people today, I think we can safely assume it's been happening to people for a very, very long time. Yeah. Now, of course, people have mystical experiences in other ways, that's for sure. Uh, but it is one of the ways. I've just thought there is an illustration. It's used on Robert Graves' Greek myths, uh, uh, which is one main ad who were the female followers of Dionysus, holding up a mushroom yeah, to another right. one. Do you remember that yeah, one? It's yeah. on the cover of the Graves thing. It's an illustration. So there are numerous hints that this was going on. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's... I'd go further. I'd say I'd 
I, really, I'd be surprised if it wasn't true. Yeah. What we can't say, and the reason that um, Peter and I haven't pushed it in our, our research, is because if you're coming out and saying Jesus doesn't exist, it's such a confronting thing for most people that we've tried to keep to everything we can absolutely meticulously back up. Mm. But here is another possibility which others have looked into much more deeply than we have, and yet really, you know, it would be such a surprise to see such a, uh, a powerfully transformative process going on that didn't draw on this in some way, because they didn't have the same taboos which we've, we've now got around changing consciousness. Yeah. The Minoan civilization on Crete, 1400 BC, when it was terminated, but uh, they worked out the field system for the Minoan civilization. They were growing more opium poppies than any other product. So here you have a whole culture, the pre precursor of the Greek culture. And we know that the name Dionysus first appears in Crete, 1400 BC, so it comes right through to, is associated with a highly psychoactive chemical. It's intoxication. Mm. Well, Dionysus is wine, isn't he? He's the god of madness. It's, he's the it's god intoxication, of wine. Yeah. ecstasy, ecstasy, stepping out. That's what that's what the the mystical experience is. It's mm. one of ecstasy. Yeah. And whilst it, it's difficult to look at the specifically, the, at least the Gnostic and pagan initiations, and go, "Oh, this was what was used," and we don't have that. We can guess, but we don't. What we do know is that an initiation. Well, first of all, the word certainly in in the Greek word that gets used doesn't mean like our word, the start of something. It comes from telos, and it means kind of a glimpse of the end of something. So what's happening to you in an initiation is that you're getting a, an experience of where you're going. So you, oh, and then you come back, and then you make the journey back to that place, and you're finding it in yourself. Now, one of the things that psychedelics does is it gives you a glimpse of something which has been kind of given to you from the outside in. You've needed to ingest this thing and something's happened to your consciousness. It's a very powerful way of doing that. And so the idea that you could have an initiation, a glimpse of the end, mm -hmm. through something which you, is taken into you, through psychedelic, or also through the influence of a teacher or, or, or a ritual, or maybe all of it, and then you're on the journey to find that in yourself, mm -hmm. because it's already in you. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is going on one way or another. It's very interesting that we can see on some carvings of Dionysus where it, he's, he's done as an effigy with a, a kind of cross-like structure in which this image is suspended. And then at the bottom there's bread and wine. Mm -hmm. We also have a, an inscription which is believed to be Mithraic, which says if you take bread and wine you will commune with the God-man, with, with Mithras in this case. And then we've got it also in Christianity. So this is clearly something which has been going on for a long time. Mm. And there, there's every possibility, I think, that in the ancient world, and maybe for the uh, Gnostics, that this was a profoundly, not just a mystical experience, yeah. a symbolic experience, but possibly a, a psychedelic one, that there would have been, um, uh, the wine would have been far more transformative than it is today. Um, because the descriptions which people give of partaking in this and especially in the mysteries, the pagan mysteries, is very extreme. They're having, you know, one hell of an experience yeah. from something. Yeah, yeah. And I do think it probably goes back to an ancient... I mean, the, the myth of Dionysus, for example, is that as a child, he is torn apart and eaten by the 12 titans, who are the ancient forces of Earth. And Zeus is angry that his son has been eaten by these earth beings, destroys them, and from the, from the uh, flesh of the titans is created humanity. So all of humanity have a spark of Dionysus inside them, because they have eaten of the god. And the mysteries was designed to purify human nature, so that you shed your human nature, your titanic nature, and the spirit is revealed, the spirit of Dionysus. Now, I think there is a connection. Many classicists think there is a connection. Behind any myth, there was an earlier ritual. So the myth explains the ritual, the ritual explains the meal. So I think at the heart of the Eleusinian mysteries was perhaps a demonstration of it itself. Twelve people 
eating the body of the God, which, of course, is exactly the vision you have at the Last Supper. Twelve people eating the body of the God. And I think that is an explanation in the ancient world of how the divine spark is in us. How is it that human beings are not just animals? We are different from animals. We are not just earthly. There's a divine spark in us. And I think this explanation is, you know, comes from this ancient cultic practice. And as Tim said, you know, the, the early Christians themselves said, yes, we know in the mysteries of Mithras, you eat the body and drink the blood of the God. Well, actually, I think it was water then in the, in the Mithraic mysteries. So they acknowledge perfectly openly that the Eucharist happens inside Mithraism. Um, and I think it was a part of all the mysteries, to be honest. I think there was a cultic meal symbolising eating the body of the God. Yeah. With, with the communion where you take the wine and the bread, it works for people because it's done in a ritual context. People do have profound experiences, but I think very often, certainly over time, you know, it's a bit of a letdown, really. Mm. Uh, what is probably uh, the case originally is that the wine would have been suffused with something. Mm. And also that the bread itself, there's a, a um, psychedelic um, fungi, well, that's where Which, LSD is, is synthesised, from ergot of rye. Yeah. And they believe that at certain points, when, when, the, when the bread was infected, and the medieval um, St Vitus dance, for example, yeah. if, the, if, the, if the, the fungus has attacked the crop before it's turned into bread, the bread itself becomes psychedelic. Becomes psychedelic. And there were many eruptions in the Middle Ages, in particularly damp summers, when the ergot would flourish, when people would would would, would go kind of crazy, and, it, and if that's so, true, then you know the way to understand religion is you've gone from a yeah. powerfully transformative event where you would take these psychoactives in a ritual <coughs> context, uh, probably alongside some sort of ritual death, mm. and your state of consciousness utterly transformed yeah. to uh, a little little bit of white wafer and some. Uh, a tiny sip of wine in a, in, a, in a context where you're going to go back and sing. But Victorian I think it hymns. must always be the function of organised religion to neuter, to emasculate the mystical experience. Because what you don't want is people having their own access to the divine. So if people are taking a divine and then having their own personal act, they don't need you. Mm. Well, what role the whole the point of organised religion is to mediate the divine. They are the intermediaries between you and God. That's the way organised religion works. So it must always, and I think it happened in Hinduism with Soma. If you read the Rig Veda, all the Vedic hymns, out of a thousand, I think 990 are hymns to Soma. It is the, the blood of the gods, it's the vision of eternity, it's the white gleaming swan of eternity. It's like, but now in Hindu culture, Soma is just a milky drink. And I think the same process has gone on. People have realised if you want to actually control people, you have to shut down their access. And it's certainly what happened with Gnosticism. Gnosticism said, no, God is in you. Like Paul said, Christ is in you. That's fatal for organised religion because then everybody can have their own personal relationship with Christ. Why do I need to go to church to experience Christ? I can do it on my own. And I think that's, you know, it's, it's inevitable, really.